Impending Fate of the Jewish Nation The Parable of the Barren Fig Tree Luke 13, 6-9 He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he to the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. The same prophetic significance is manifest in this parable, which is almost the counterpart of that in Isaiah 5, both in form and meaning. The true interpretation is so obvious as to render explanation scarce necessary. Its bearing on the people of Israel is most distinct and direct, more especially when viewed in connection with the preceding warnings. Israel is the fruitless tree, long cultivated, but yielding no return to the owner. It was now on its last trial. The axe, as John the Baptist had declared, was laid at the root of the tree. But the fatal blow was delayed at the intercession of mercy. The Saviour was then at his gracious work of nurture and culture. A little longer, and the decree would go forth, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? No doubt there were general principles in this, as in the other parables, applicable to all nations and all ages, but we must not lose sight of its original and primary reference to the Jewish people. Steer and Alford seemed to lose themselves in searching for recondite and mystical meanings in the minor details of the imagery, but Neander gives a luminous explanation of its true import. As the fruitless tree, failing to realise the aim of its being, was destroyed, so the theocratic nation, for the same reason, was to be overtaken after long forbearance by the judgment of God and cut out of his kingdom. End of the age or close of the Jewish dispensation. Parables of the Tares and of the Dragnet Matthew 13, 36 to 47 Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field He answered and said unto them He that soweth the good seed is the son of man The field is the world The good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one the enemy that sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, that is the age, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world, the age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea, and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to the shore, and sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, or the age. The angels shall come forth, and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We find in the passages here quoted an example of one of those erroneous renderings which have done much to confuse and mislead the ordinary reader of our English version. It is probable that 99 in every 100 understand by the phrase the end of the world, the close of human history, and the destruction 
of the material earth. They would not imagine that the world in verse 38 and the world in verse 39 and 40 are totally different words, with totally different meanings. Yet such is the fact. Koinus in verse 38 is rightly translated world and refers to the world of men. But Aeon in verse 39 and 40 refers to a period of time and should be rendered age or epoch. Lang translates it Aeon. It is of the greatest importance to understand correctly the two meanings of this word and of the phrase the end of the Aeon or age. Aeon is, as we've said, a period of time or an age. It is exactly equivalent to the Latin word Avon, which is merely Aeon in Latin dress. And the phrase Greek coming, translated in our English version, the end of the world should be the close of the age. Tittman observed Greek coming as it occurs in the New Testament does not denote the end but rather the consummation of the aeon which is to be followed by a new age. So in Matthew 13, 39, 40, 49 and 24, 3 which last passage it is to be feared may be misunderstood in applying it to the destruction of the world. It was the belief of the Jews that the Messiah would introduce a new eon and this new eon or age they called the kingdom of heaven. The existing eon therefore was the Jewish dispensation which was now drawing to its close and now it would terminate. Our Lord impressively shows in these parables. It is indeed surprising that expositors should have failed to recognize in these solemn predictions the the reproduction and rhetorician of the words of Malachi and of John the Baptist. Here we find the same final separation between the righteous and the wicked, the same purging of the floor, the same gathering of the wheat into the garner, the same burning of the chef, tears or stubble into the fire. Can there be any doubt that it is the same act of judgment, the same period of time, the same historical event that Malachi John and our Lord refer. But we have seen that John the Baptist predicted a judgment which was then impending, a catastrophe so near that already the axe was laid at the root of the trees. In accordance with the prophecy of Malachi that the great and dreadful day of the Lord was to follow on the coming of the second Elijah. We are therefore brought to the conclusion that this discrimination between the righteous and the wicked this gathering of the wheat into the garner and burning of the tares in the furnace of fire refers to the same catastrophe, i.e. the wrath which came upon that very generation when Jerusalem was literally a burning fire and the aeon of Judaism came to a close in the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This conclusion is supported by the fact that there is a close connection between this great judicial epoch and the coming of the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord represents the separation of the righteous and the wicked as a characteristic of that great consummation which is called the kingdom of God. But the kingdom was declared to be at hand. It follows therefore that the parables before us relate not to a remote event still in the future but to one which in our Saviour's time was near. An additional argument in favour of this view is derived from the consideration that our Lord in his explanation of the parable of the tares speaks of himself as the sower of the good seed. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. It is to his own personal ministry and its results that he refers and we must therefore regard the parable as having a special bearing upon his contemporaries. It is in perfect harmony with his own solemn warnings in Luke 13:26 where he describes the condemnation of those who were privileged to enjoy his personal presence and ministrations, the pretenders to discipleship who were tares and not wheat. Then shall we begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught us in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. However applicable to men, in general under the gospel such language may be, it is plain that it had its direct and specific bearing upon the contemporaries of our Lord, the generation that witnessed his miracles and heard his parables, and that it has a relation to them such as it can have to none else. We find in the conclusion of the parable of the tares an impressive note between Nota Ben, drawing special attention to the instructions therein contained. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. We may take occasion from this to make a remark on the vast importance of a true conception of the period at which our Lord and his apostles taught. This is indispensable to the correct understanding of the New Testament doctrine respecting the kingdom of God, the end of the age, and the coming aeon, or world to come. That period was near the close of the Jewish dispensation. The Mosaic economy, it is called the system of laws and institutions given to the nation by God himself, and which had existed for more than 40 generations, was about to be superseded to pass away. Already the last generation that was to possess the land was upon the scene, the last and also the worst, the children and heir of its predecessors. The long period during which Jehovah had exhausted all the methods which divine wisdom and love could devise for the culture and reformation of Israel was about to come to an end. It was to close disastrously. The wrath, long pent up and restrained, was to burst forth and overwhelm that generation. Its last day was to be a dias era, the great and terrible day of the Lord. That is the end of the age, so often referred to by our Lord and constantly predicted by his apostles. Already they stood within the penumbra of that tremendous cries, which was every day advancing nearer and nearer and which was at last to come suddenly as a thief in the night. This is the true explanation of those constant exhortations to vigilance, patience and hope which abound in the apostolic epistles. They lived expecting a consummation which was to arrive in their own time and which they might witness with their own eyes. This fact lies on the very face of the New Testament writings. It is the key to the interpretation of much that would otherwise be obscured and unintelligible, and we shall see in the process of this investigation how consistently this view is supported by the whole tenor of the New Testament scriptures.